Today's a special day because we're going to take communion together. But we're going to do it at the close of my teaching because I'm going to teach on communion this morning because I believe that it's necessary for us to understand the power in communion. And so I want us to pray, and then I want to uh, make some comments, do a little bit of teaching, and then we're going to move into communion. We're going to close out the service today at the Lord's table. So, Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for the worship team and for the work that they've put in to lead us into your presence today. Thank you for the hearts of everyone who's present and for their willingness to worship you and to be here this morning and dedicate the first hours of a week uh, to proclaim your name. So, Father, we just pray that uh, you will now come in a powerful way. And, Lord, just teach us your heart and your word and your way. Help us to say the things that you want us to say and eliminate anything that would distract. We just pray that your presence would be supremely sovereign in this room. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for everything you've done for us. For it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, we've spent a great deal of time talking about the visible and the invisible realm. But then again, so did Jesus when he was here on this earth. That's what Jesus talked about. If Jesus were present today and he was standing here on the stage in my place, and he was speaking to you, Jesus would be talking about the same subject as I've been talking about for a number of weeks. That is, the kingdom of heaven and how the kingdom of heaven interacts with earth, how it interacts with the physical realm. As a matter of fact, Christ is here. And by His Spirit, He is speaking to us in profound ways. He's speaking to us about the life of new creation and how we as new creatures are to live in the new creation that was launched at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If He were here, and He is, He is speaking then to us about how to abide in Him, how to sit with Him in heavenly places, and from that position live out our life in a physical way. He is teaching us about how to abound victoriously in the physical world. He is speaking to us about how to be strengthened in our faith and how to continue to receive grace in order to glorify God and, and to be the priests and the prophets and the kings that He's called us to be. Are you hearing me? These are the words of Jesus. These are the teachings of Jesus because Jesus was all about the kingdom of God and how that kingdom interacts with the physical dimension. At the resurrection of Christ, new creation was launched. And since that day, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, God through His Spirit has been working to bring into full maturity heaven and earth together as one. You will hear that woven in and out of every message perhaps that I ever preach because that is the sole purpose for God's work in the earth and through the church. You will hear grace woven in and out of every message because grace is the power of God, come on, that enables me to what? Do what I cannot do in my natural ability. You got it. Amen. I'm glad you listened. So grace is the power of God that enables me to stand in the gap between heaven and earth and bring two dimensions together so that the kingdom of God can be fully manifested in the physical realm. That is the purpose of God, and that's the purpose of the church. That's your purpose. Whether you know it or not, that is your purpose as a believer, as a new creature now in Christ Jesus. And so it's bringing heaven and earth together as one. Say, as one. There are a variety of ways that the church, the body of Christ, receives this grace that I'm talking about so that we can effectively stand in the gap and pull those two dimensions together, heaven and earth. These ways are things we're familiar with on a daily basis that we should be practicing but often do not. For example, prayer, both individually and corporately, is a means by which we receive grace from God, and then we are strengthened to do the will of God in the way of God. Prayer 
is a very powerful thing that releases grace into our lives. Would you say amen? But also prophesying the Word of God into everyday life. It's not just prophesying, but it's prophesying the Word of God into everyday life. And we're going to be doing a series of teachings in November and December on the gifts of the Spirit and why we are uh, a church that believes in the present-day operation of the gifts of the Spirit. And some of the things that I'm going to teach is going to be quite new and, and interesting and maybe a different spin and take on some of the things you've heard in Pentecostal charismatic circles. But one of the things that I want to teach you and, and allude to today is the fact that when we prophesy, we're not just prophesying what we feel. We're not called to prophesy what we feel. We're not, even pro we're not even called to prophesy what we think. Prophecy is the declaration and decree of God's heart and God's Word. And so when we talk about prophesying the Word of God into everyday life, it is about discerning what God is saying to us about someone and then having enough knowledge of the Word of God, we're able to then prophesy the Word of God into people's circumstances and situations of life. And that's why we got a lot of prophets that are false prophets because they don't know the Word of God. But I won't go there today. I deviate sometimes. But prophesying the Word of God into everyday life is a way in which grace is released into the earth and thus bringing heaven and earth together. But then there's operating in all the gifts of the Spirit, not just in the area of prophecy, but all the gifts of the Spirit, whether it's, it's praying in tongues and declaring prophecy in tongues, or whether it's, it's uh, laying hands on people and seeing them healed if God so desires. And there are many different gifts. There's, there's motivational gifts, there's manifestational gifts, there's miraculous gifts, and all the gifts are good for today. And these gifts, when operational in our lives, and not always just in the church, but did you know gifts? I'm getting into my series in November. Hush up, Randy. <laughs> gifts are intended not for us to just play with in here, but they're to exercise out there and change the world. So that's as much as I'll say on that. But it is a, an avenue through which grace flows. Grace for you to operate in them, but grace for those that the gift is directed towards. Because grace is needed. It's the power of God that enables me to do what I cannot do in my natural ability. It is the power of God that enables me to be an intercessor, to stand in the gap between heaven and earth, and with one hand on heaven and one hand on earth, pull those things together so that new creation becomes a living reality. And that's what God's desire is, new creation to be a living reality. But it's walking in signs and wonders, releasing righteousness and justice and holiness into the world all around us, into the community, into the people, into the neighborhoods, into our neighbors, by, by the way in which we live and the way in which we speak and the way in which we love. You see, this, the grace of God is, is something that needs to flow through us and into everything around us. And all these things are tools or means by which grace comes into a physical reality. But there are two in particular that operate in the church and among the corporate body. And those things are called the sacraments of the church, baptism and communion. You see, when the Lord established and commanded that baptism and communion be observed, he intended that they would release something into the physical realm, out of the invisible realm into the visible realm. In other words, they're like conduits or openings or, if you, or, 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 or uh, portals is what I'm looking for, portals, if you will, from the invisible realm to the visible realm. Now, don't get scared by some of the terms I use, no matter how spooky they seem, because what I'm talking about is biblical. As a matter of fact, it was, it was Jacob who laid his head down on a stone and had a dream, and, a, and the heavens opened up, and angels began to ascend and descend. You remember that story? And he said, this is nothing more than the house of God, a portal to heaven, if you will, where all of heaven could come to earth. So when I use terms like that, it does require a biblical explanation. But baptism and communion are no different than that because they are sacraments in the Lord's house, therefore opening a way for us to experience something 
that is beyond this physical realm. How many of you want to experience something beyond the physical realm? And so these two things are very important to us. And the Lord intended for these things to be released to us so that we could experience new creation. In a mysterious and miraculous way, new creation is present with us. No matter what we see with our human eye, we see all the, the death and destruction and disease of this world. We see all the darkness and, and all the evil. We see it. So when we hear a preacher like me say, there is the reality of new creation that is existing right now, that, that stumps our mind and blows our mind, and we can't seem to grasp that. But the reality is this, is that new creation has already begun. It exists in the invisible realm, but it's not intended to stay in the invisible realm. The kingdom of heaven is not intended to remain in the spirit world, but rather God, through Jesus Christ, is wanting to bring that into fullness in the physical realm. And we are the tools and the co-laborers with God to allow that to happen. And the reason why it is not as obvious is because we're not as involved. The church does not have this revelation nor this understanding, and so we're just struggling with the physical realm, and we don't understand the invisible realm. And when our heads and our hearts get locked into our position in heaven, then we'll be able to see something and believe something and therefore behave after that kind. But until then, we're going to struggle with understanding. He that hath eyes to see, let him see. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Do you remember those words that Jesus spoke? He spoke those to his disciples because Jesus was giving them parables, and in the parables he was giving them clues to the invisible realm, yet they could not understand. And Jesus said, this, this comes by having your eyes and your mind and your heart open. Others aren't going to get it. They're only going to hear riddles. But you can know the truth if you'll open yourself up to it. And I pray you will. Say, I will. You see, every time we baptize a new believer, and every time we partake of the Lord's meal, we are experiencing, we are expressing, and we are expanding the new creation. Every time we dunk somebody in this pool over here, who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, every time we submerge them in this water, it is a sign of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the launching of new creation. So every time that person comes up out of the water, we just experience new creation. That's why it's a sacrament. And we expand new creation by every believer that comes into the family. We express new creation. We experience new creation. So let us understand how important it is to partake of Holy Communion today. Because it's not just a ritual. It's just not another activity. It's not something that we just tack on to, to make us seem spiritual and to fulfill our obligation as, as some do. You see, when we experience communion by taking the bread and the wine, the past and the future come to meet us in the present. As we partake, we encounter the presence in the life of Jesus, not just to defeat evil in our lives, but also so that we ourselves can shine God's light in the world. Something wonderful and majestic happens through communion. Our lives are to be lifted to a whole nother level of spirituality. Communion is not just about me and my salvation. It is a transaction that enables us to be God's new creation people. It is a transaction that transforms. When we drink the wine, we taste the new creation on our tongues and in our mouths. When we take the bread, we receive in our bodies the broken body of Jesus that brings healing to our bodies. All of this is important so that we can go out and do the kind of work in the world that helps bring in the kingdom of God, God's new creation. And when we say kingdom of God and we say new creation, we use those interchangeably because that's exactly what it is. The mission of God in the world is, of course, the challenge for humans to repent 
to believe, to accept Jesus, to know Him deeply for themselves, to rejoice in the salvation, and, and for that salvation to have a full effect on the whole being of an individual, body, soul, and spirit. But it's also simultaneously to become agents of new creation. We're not just to encounter Jesus in a deep way for ourselves, but to become agents of change. You are an agent of change. Come on, say yes. And that means wherever you go and whatever you do and whoever you're with, God's called you to be an agent of change and transformation. In other words, you are responsible as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, to stand in the gap between heaven and earth and on behalf of others, bring heaven into their earth. Bring heaven into your world by the way in which you live your life in the physical, but it's directed from the spiritual. From the throne room of grace is where we get our decrees and declarations. From the throne room of grace is where we get our instructions and directions. From the throne room of grace is where we get the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that we can function in the physical realm as spiritual beings. And so it's about changing and transforming the world in which you live. And so it is to become agents of change, agents of the new creation wherever there's hunger, wherever there's poverty, wherever there's injustice, we are called to make a difference. We're not just called to win souls, though we are. We're to be fishers of men. But we're also to be agents of change in all of society, in all the realms of society. We're to have a prophetic voice in the government. We're to have a prophetic voice in the education. We're to have a prophetic voice in, in all of the situations and circumstances and jurisdictions of earth. Because we're agents of change. We're ministers of reconciliation. We're ambassadors of another world, another kingdom, a new creation. Are you hearing me? So in celebrating communion, we must see it as something far more significant than we've ever seen it before. It is, it is an actual experience with the living Jesus. When celebrating communion, I'm deeply moved by a sense of His presence. Not the, necessarily the physical presence where we're actually going to see the physical body of Jesus except that we see the physical body of Jesus in one another. Because after all, why does the Bible call us the body of Christ? So that we would have a physical representation of Him on the earth. But He's the head of that body. And we don't have His head here, but we are connected to the head in the spirit realm. That's why we're seated with Him in heavenly places, because the body of Christ needs to be connected to the head. Are you getting this? So, when we celebrate communion, and we may not necessarily see the head here, but we see the body of Christ, it, there's a sense of, of His fullness. The fullness of the head and the body being connected. The fullness. That's what communion is. It's bringing the head and the body together. So that there is a physical expression of what actually exists in the spirit realm, which is far more real than the physical, by the way. Let me say that again because that just went over your head. That The spirit realm is far more real than the physical realm. But, but, but not to us because we've been bound by the physical because of our separation from God through sin. But when confronted with that reality of Jesus Christ in our midst and Jesus Christ through the elements and through the communion experience, when we get a sense of that, it, it, it should do something to us. It should drive us to our knees. It should drive us to a place of humility. The fear of the Lord comes because of what Christ has done for us. Communion is more than an ordinance. It is a sacrament in that it draws us into an experiential relationship with Christ through the elements. The sacrifice of Jesus and the sacrificial self-offering of, of believers, you and I, is always, from the human point of view, a response to grace. Always a response to grace. As a matter of fact, listen to Romans 12.1, and I'm almost done. Now that's shocking, isn't it? Romans 12, 1, Paul says, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or which is true worship. Offer yourselves a living sacrifice, 
Protestants are always afraid that if you say that communion is a sacrifice, you are somehow repeating the crucifixion. And this is why people struggle with, with communion being called a sacrament. Catholics are always afraid that Protestants are trying to do something that adds to the sacrifice of Christ. Ironically, both Protestants and Catholic theologians have regularly accused each other of adding to the finished work of Christ. So there's this theological debate going on over what we call or how we experience communion. But communion is neither a second crucifixion of Christ, nor is it an addition to the sacrifice of Christ. What it does do is take us back in time to Golgotha's hill as well as take us forward in time to new creation. That's what communion does. It takes us to the very place where Jesus was crucified and sacrificed for our sin. And what it does is it draws us into it so that we are willing to sacrifice our lives. Every time we take communion, it is not crucifying Jesus again but it is me dying to myself again. And how many times do you have to die to yourself? Every day. Every day. I mean, come on, Apostle Paul was one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, and he had to die to himself every day. How much more so? I have to die about every minute. But dying is what it's about. See, Jesus died once for all, never more to be crucified, never needing for his blood to be shed again. But I need to die over and over and over and over again until he perfects me and glorifies me in that ultimate new creation state. This is important for us to grasp with our hearts and with our lives. So why communion? Asking why we should celebrate communion is like asking why we should breathe. We celebrate communion as a sign and as a seal of His presence in our midst. And if we avoid it or we downgrade it or we marginalize it, we are actually scorning our Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Above all, we need His life to be our life. And communion is one of those experiences, literal experiences, where, where we can surrender our life once again and we can take on the grace of God which enables us to live His life. That's what's called the exchange life. God wants us to live that exchanged life. Communion is where earth reflects heaven where the invisible realm becomes visible. It is in the elements that we have a physical representation of what Christ did for us, both physically and spiritually. In communion, we get a glimpse of the new creation, which is the tangible result of what Christ has done for us and what Christ is doing through us. See, it's not just about what Christ has done for us. It's not just a memorial. It is that, but it's not just that. It's not only about what He's done for us, it's about what He's doing through us. Come on, say amen. Because we're all part of what God is up to in the physical realm. Communion and baptism are outward signs of the invisible and internal work of salvation that requires a sacrifice, and therefore it qualifies as a sacrament. The word sacrament and the word sacrifice come from the same root word and the same root meaning. In Romans 3, 22 through 25, it says, They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by His blood, effective through faith. Through faith. Say, faith. So to partake of communion is to once again declare your faith in Christ. So when I, when I take this cup this morning at the end of this service and I take this bread and I hold it in my hand and when I take that bread and I take that, that cup, I am once again, I am once again dedicating my life to Jesus and I'm saying I'm willing to continue to move forward in you, Lord Jesus. It is a surrender of your life to the Lordship of Christ. It is a declaration and a decree of a commitment to follow on with Him. That's why we celebrate communion, because we all need to re-up. 
We all need to re-up. That's what dying daily is. Dying daily is, all right, I'm dying to myself so I can re-up for God. I'm going to serve Him today. I, I'm, I'm going to reconnect with Him today. I am going to believe Him and trust Him and glorify Him and worship Him and adore Him today. I'm re-upping for this assignment, Lord. And that's what communion is. But it's communion not on a personal level. It's a communion of the saints. It's a corporate thing. We together are linking arms and joining hands and coming together with one heart and one mind. And as a people group, we're saying, count us in. We're re-upping. We're renewing our faith. We're renewing our commitment. We're renewing our vow. We're, We're making covenant once again with God through Jesus Christ, who has made the ultimate covenant through the sacrifice of his life and the shedding of his blood. So what is communion? Ultimately, also known as the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, well, first and foremost, communion is a narrative. It is a narrative like baptism. It's a story. It's God's story. It's the world's story. It's Israel's story. It's Jesus' story. And by the way, it's our story. That's what communion is. In communion, there's the presence of the living Jesus. And having had our hearts touched by the Spirit and warmed by the reading of the Scriptures, we come in reverential prayer before Him, and we come to know Him more fully in the breaking of the bread and the reception of the wine. That's how the narrative works. It's a story that we come to be more familiar with. And when we participate in communion, that story saturates our very being. By the drinking of the wine and the eating of the bread, that story gets into us in every nook and cranny of our being so that we're full of the story, we're full of the gospel, we're full of grace, we're full of the Spirit, we're full of Him. Come on, can you see this? trying to make this come alive for you today because it's much more than just a ritual. It's a narrative. And that's how narratives work. Secondly, it's a portrait of unity. All sorts of things flow from this, but the idea I want to close with here, and my closing's quite long, I know already. I believe passionately that all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ belong at the same table. No matter what your ethnicity is, your culture, your, your social background, I don't care what it is, your race, your, your creed, your color, all in Christ belong at the Lord's table. According to Galatians 2, that's actually what justification by faith is all about. All those who belong to God through Christ belong at the Lord's table. And when we come to the table of the Lord with the same heart and same mind, we literally experience the unity of heaven and earth coming together. That's what it's all about. It's one of those fresh powerful, renewing moments when we together with one heart and one mind come together and we take of the broken body of Christ and we drink of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and we do it together with one spirit and one heart, we're saying this is a moment where heaven and earth come together. This is new creation. And we're new creatures experiencing that new creation. And so... Oneness of the spiritual and the physical. Oneness of the invisible and the visible. It's a portrait of unity. Thirdly, it's a place of grace, as I've already alluded to. The table of the Lord is a place where grace is ministered, but not through the elements. This is where some movements and denominations get off track. Is where they, 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 they take the elements and they make the elements something more than they are. But, but grace doesn't come through the elements. It doesn't come through the cracker. And it doesn't come through the juice or the wine. Grace is received through faith. Not through elements. However, elements are visible representations of how the love of God was communicated to us. In other words, that, that bread represents the broken body of Jesus. And this is how Jesus conveyed his love to us. That wine represents the blood of Jesus, or in our case, juice. It represents the blood of Jesus, and that's how Jesus conveys His love or conveys grace to us. It's through the shedding 
and the pouring out of his blood. So we partake of the communion elements. We are once again then expressing our faith in the sacrifice of Christ, and therefore we receive grace because of our response to what he has done. Grace is not from the elements. Grace is from our response to Jesus, therefore expressed by taking the elements, and we receive grace. Amen? It's a place of grace. Grace received through communion renews our faith. Faith begets faith. Faith is like a muscle. You have to exercise it for it to get bigger. And when you exercise your faith, you get more faith. Faith begets faith. As John Wesley said, through the sacraments we encounter the grace of God, and this grace moves us on towards perfection. So while there is a sanctifying aspect to communion, it is rooted in the renewed awareness of our faith and the saving work of Christ. This is not just about remembering again, though it is vital to remember, but it is about what happened in the past becoming a living reality in the present. It is making his sacrifice fresh. Not again, just fresh, and therefore sacramental. So truly in closing now, truly, Truly, I say unto thee, I am closing. Communion is an act of renouncing the world. It is an act of renewing our faith and revealing the body of Christ. The result of communion is a reception of grace that enables us to move forward in greater purity, stronger faith, and divine unity with God and with one another. So... May we embrace the magnitude and the significance of it, communion. It is at the table of the Lord that we truly experience Him in a living way. It is positioning ourselves with those disciples at that last supper and sitting with Christ who said, I will not eat again until we are in the kingdom together, until we are in the new creation together. And while some think, well, that's yet to come, that's in the future, I got news for you. When Jesus rose from the dead, he sat on his throne. The kingdom was realized. The new creation was launched. And today we have an opportunity to sit at his table, not away from him, but with him in the kingdom, in the new creation. This is what it means when we say that new creation is underway. And we, the body of Christ, can co-labor with God to reveal heaven and earth as one. So let us close out our time together in His presence at His table. Please bow your heads.